uh, my name is Steve Zeltzer, and I'm, uh, I produce a show on KPFA called Workweek Radio on Tuesday at 3.30 or 4, and also I'm a staff representative on the local station board representing the staff. So I want to greet you, brothers and sisters, for coming to this important meeting. Uh, it's interesting today, there's a, another article in the Chronicle, uh, the pink section, that KPFA has been saved again. Uh, by a loan. So uh, there's been a lot of coverage in the media about KPFA and Pacifica, and I'm sure all of you here are here because you're concerned about uh, Pacifica and KPFA and what happens to uh, alternative media in the United States, as uh, I am and many other people are. So <clears throat> the, um, the issues that uh, have faced KPFA and Pacifica are, of course, are not unique. Uh, the corporatization of the media, the media monopolies want to destroy any kind of alternative media in this country uh, that have a, an anti-war line, that have a line taking on capitalism and, and the billionaires. And uh, it's obvious that um, the, uh, the concern, particularly uh, that is happening now about the media is, is becoming media monopolies. One company, like Sinclair, controlling all the stations. Uh, and in a community controlling the radio, the TV, and even the newspapers is a threat to democracy and, and democratic rights for all people in the United States. This is a critical question. So uh, KPFA and Pacifica has been a very important alternative historically to the mainstream media um, from, the, from when it was set up against war uh, and against uh, U.S. imperialism and the wars of U.S. imperialism. And today, uh, with Trump as the president, uh, uh, the danger of war is growing. Um, the uh, U.S. troops in the Ukraine, uh, surrounding of Russia, war threats against Russia, I mean sanctions. It should be sanctions against the United States for all the invasions the United States has been involved in. You know, talk about sanctions. You know, how about sanctioning the biggest <laughs> intervener in, in countries? And of course, also, uh, the whole question of the Asian pivot and the threat to, to destroy North Korea, uh, the contempt uh, by Vice President Pence of the Korean people uh, when he uh, refused to stand. Uh, he, did a, he did a knee, but he did a knee for right-wing reasons. Uh, 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 and the Korean people, of course, are opposed to war. Uh, they don't want a war because it would mean the loss of millions and millions of, of lives in Asia. So these issues of, of war and peace are something that Pacifica and KPFA have to be involved in. It's a question of survival of, of the people of this country and the people of the world. And we're going to learn some important things uh, today, important some opportunities for Pacifica and KPFA, because uh, when I uh, uh, first became aware of KPFA, my grandmother actually listened to uh, KPFA and used to call in, uh, it was during the 60s when there was a mass movement. And one of the reasons that KPFA had such a relevance is it would actually cover things live. Like there were mass rallies at UC. Uh, and, and they were covered live by, by KPFA. And, and it had tremendous support. And this is something that we want to talk about in this forum. And that is covering the live struggles that are going on in this country and in the Bay Area so that people can hear the voices of the people who are involved in them. When thousands of people march against the Nazis, KPFA should be there live asking people why they're there and what the issues are. When thousands of women march, we should be there live interviewing the women and the people participating in these marches. And if you want to know how KPFA and Pacific can, can become relevant, if we start covering these mass movements live, we will get a relevant and large audience. People will begin to pay attention and we can solve some of our financial problems. Uh, and that's some of the things that we will be talking about today. So, one of the, we're going to start off by uh, struggles that have taken place in the history of KPFA. And of course, there have been uh, always internal struggles at KPFA. This is nothing new. From the beginning of KPFA and Pacifica Foundation, there have always been struggles of who's in charge, uh, democracy, and uh, KPFA being uh, a, a vision for all the people. And uh, the first uh, speaker uh, who has a long struggle in KPFA for democracy uh, and is a programmer in Mendocino uh, is Jeff Blankford. And Jeff Blankford has been involved in a long struggle for democracy in KPFA and the Pacific uh, Foundation. So welcome, Jeff Blankford. Yeah, 
Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming. This is a very important subject, which was dear to my life going back to uh, when I first started listening to KPFA back in the, I guess, 60s, 70s. And, but in 1992, uh, something came up that disturbed me. At that time, uh, David Salnicker, the director of Pacifica, uh, had ruled that there'd be no discussion or critical discussion of Zionism on KPFA and Pacifica. And lo and behold, KPFA initiated a new program, a pro-Israel program, by a Zionist fellow I knew. And I went to a KPFA staff meeting to say this program should not be on the air. But I found out something that night which changed my mind completely, not about the program, but something was much more important. Larry Bensky had with him uh, the strategic um, strategy for national programming, a thick booklet Pacifica had put out, and he let me take a look at it. And lo and behold, what did I find? That Pacifica had already, this is in 1992, approached and applied for loans from the Pew Foundation, Ford Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation. And in the strategy, it said, we will tailor our programming to meet the demands of these foundations. This was astonishing. Bensky didn't think there was a problem with it, but I did. And there was a fellow, the late Werner Hertz, also did. And we started something called Save KPFA, which our name was later ripped off by people who had nothing to do to trying to save KPFA years later. Um, so what happened, we started having meet local meetings. And then in 1993, early in February 1993, there was a meeting, a uh, Pacifica board meeting down in Los Angeles, but not Los Angeles, actually. It was on the Beverly Hills border, one block south of the Sunset Strip, one block um, east of Doheny. Um, a very fancy neighborhood, a very fancy hotel, non-union hotel, which was being picketed, our meeting was picketed, the Pacific meeting, by KPFK programmers, who black programmers, who stood around the board members with signs saying, plantation radio, no, liberation radio, yes. Out in front, members of KPFK staff programmers, volunteers, paid, walked up and down protesting, while Pat Scott, a former member of the Communist Party, an African-American woman, and it was very important that I identify her as such, because she was out there at the time explaining to some young men walking up down the street what was actually happening and who these crazies were picketing her meeting. Uh, Pat Scott apparently had been selected by someone, and I'm saying a US government, to destroy Pacifica and change what it was. This required, as we found out, in 1995, first the firing of Bill Mandel from the air, a longtime programmer on Soviet affairs. He was taken off the air. And unfortunately, the staff at KPFA acquiesced in this. Uh, why was he taken off the air? Because he was, had a segment every Wednesday morning on East Europe. And one morning he decided, rather than talking about the, what was going on in East Europe, he was a Soviet specialist, he was so outraged by a racist article, column by Art Hoppe, a San Francisco Chronicle columnist, that he felt he had to speak out against this racist column by Art Hoppe. For Pacifica, for KPFA, Bill Mandel had gone off subject and he was taken off the air. There was a small protest up and down in front of the station, but that was it. All the members of the KPFA staff went along with that at the time. I'm sorry? He died. Never been replaced. Never been replaced. Never been, yes. And, yeah. In any case, um, Bill had a program for 30 years on the air. And he stood for, you know, for civil rights, for justice. He was, he was confronted in the McCarthy Committee, he, uh, a man of tremendous courage. And yet, 
there was, you could add up all the programmers at KPFA, they didn't have that kind of courage. And Bill Mandel was let go. And unfortunately, someone took it off the Pacifica chronology, which I helped to contribute to. But that was in May 1995. Since that attracted no protest, significant protest, Pat Scott then followed with the purge of maybe 150 volunteer programmers from KPFA. Up to that point, KPFA and all the Pacific stations were essentially programmed by volunteers. So you would have people, actually working people, say four people would be in a group, a collective, a, a labor collective or Native American, um, uh, African American, and they'd have a different host every week. So those people who were actually working people could be, do programmings on KP, programs on KPFA and also work at a job and be connected to reality. Whereas what happened afterward, Pat Scott decided in 1995 that we had to professionalize the sound at KPFA. And that means hire programmers, pay programmers, and eliminate the volunteers. This is why KPFA has to raise money one out of every five days every year because of the huge number of paid programmers. And it's hard to reverse that. This is her legacy. In any case, for example, Jerry Brown might not be governor today if it wasn't for Pat Scott putting him on the air from noon to one, Monday through Friday, replacing a number of popular programmers, including Mama O'Shea, who had a shout out program, had been on for many years, was really popular. There was no discussion about this. This was an arbitrary, hands down thing. And of course, Mama also had a very good position on Palestine. Uh, and I had been a guest on her program a number of times. So this was an example of what happened. And then people were started protesting. We had meetings at Ashkenaz and around. Um, we started something called Take Back KPFA after that firing. And then we found out that when we went to Pacifica board meetings, we could not get the agenda, we could not get the minutes, and the, and the program, the meetings, were improperly, illegally announced according to Corporation of Public Broadcasting regulations. It got to the point where I went down in 1993, I should say, the first one, um, after I'd made this discovery, in which they approved, the Pacifica board approved the strategy for national programming, the one where they were picketing, uh, Mariah Gallard, who you'll hear from later, she had requested at a previous board meeting up in Berkeley a financial report on some irregularities. And Jack O'Dell, who was the president of Pacifica, who had been a friend of mine, and as it had been Pat Scott, a friend of mine, Jack O'Dell, the president of Pacifica, promised us that we could make our personal statements after we made statements representing the groups he represented. Uh, I believe Mariah was representing unpaid staff, and I was representing Take Back KPFA. But then we weren't allowed to make our own statements afterward. And because um, the board was upset at all these protesters, Jack O'Dell uh, adjourned the meeting. Mariah stood by the door as they were leaving, trying to give them papers about the, describing Pacifica's financial regularity. We found out later the next week on the air that, Pacific, that Mariah had been accused of violence, physical violence, against Pacific board members, a, including a pregnant woman. And despite the fact that KPFK had filmed everything, and there was not a shred of evidence, we could not get a lawyer here in the Bay Area to take Mariah's case of defamation on the air, on the air by KPFA. Um, 1995, take back KPFA then sent me down to Houston for the board meeting. But it wasn't in Houston. It was halfway between Houston and Galveston at a resort that was not accessible by public transportation. There were three board meetings taking place in that resort. Pacifica, Bear Aspirin, and Penn's Oil. Good company, right? So I walked into the the boardroom with my tape recorder and microphone out with uh, Jackie, a uh, Native American programmer from KPFT. And immediately Pat Scott said, Jeff Blankford is, is in the room. 
and, and they immediately, the chair of the board took, changed the agenda. Everything that was public was now an executive session. So we were allowed to sit in the back of the room and Roberta Brooks, I believe her name was, who worked for Ron Dellum, was the secretary of Pacifica, she walked all the way back to see my tape recorder wasn't running. So then we had to leave during the major part of the meeting. That night, was, it was the 25th anniversary celebration of KPFT. And we, I went there with Jackie to the party at the hotel downtown. Garland Gantner, the general manager of KPFT, who would later be brought in by Pacifica, to run the station when they boarded it up with, uh, with, in 1999, Garland Ganter saw me and had the police, security police, take me out of the building, out of the hotel in Houston. This is Pacifica Radio. Um, by 1997, oh, excuse me, I'll go at, at, That story made its way into Current, uh, an organ, trade organ of, of, uh, of, of uh, nonprofit radio. I get a call from a guy named, um, what's his name, Brian? Um, uh, um, 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 Brian McConville, he was an investigator for the C CPB, called me, and he said, I want to talk to you about what happened to you in, in, in Houston, in Pacifica? I said, I'm not ready to talk about it. He said, it's not up to you. It's our job to monitor what is going on in public radio, community radio. And so he started investigating Pacifica. He was the number three person in the CPB. 17 days later, he's told to, to clean out his drawer and leave the office immediately. He said, what about the Pacifica investigation? Forget about it. Then um, I call later to um, uh, the acting inspector general, Mike Donovan. Very friendly guy. I'm talking about the problems with Pacifica. He said, sounds like you've got a case. We're going to deal with it the first of the year. First of the year comes and goes. I call end of January. Uh, Mike Donovan, please. Uh, he's no longer with us. Uh, someone had intervened. The federal government had intervened. They did not want Pacific investigated. Now, finally, they hired a former Army IG, and he came out to interview some of us, Mariah, myself, and a few other people. And I, 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 and I made, I actually made a formal legal document stating all the violations that Pacific had, uh, had made of the CPB. Um, regulations, and I went back in 1997 to testify in front of the CPB. I walk into his office, and he says to me, this is the Inspector General of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the fix is in. I said, what do you mean? He said, I have found, I'm supporting your report, what you wrote is correct, is true, but the statement that's going to be made by the head of the board of the CPB is going to give a whitewash to Pacifica and say the exact opposite. I say, I can't believe that. He says, that's the way it is. And by the way, when we go into the meeting, we should go in through separate doors. <laughs> then, <laughs> I, this is the CPB. There's. I go in there, there's Nicole Sawaya, who was working for NPR there, who was my neighbor in San Francisco, wouldn't talk to me. There was a seat with my name on it. There's Jack O'Dell, my old friend, who I had kept posted about what was going on, thinking I could trust him, I couldn't. Jack is glaring at me, and here is a CPB praising Pacifica for all the wonderful work it's done, and Jack is gleaming. And when Pat Scott retired in 1998, Robert Coonrod, Coonrod, who was the head of the CPB, but the former head of Voice of America, and Radio Marti, put out a special press release praising Pat Scott for the great work she'd done for Pacifica. Now, I have maintained all along, this was a COINTEL operation, Pacifica was too important not to be destroyed, and it still is, 
And this is why the government will use um, agents, collaborators, and useful idiots uh, to destroy this station, destroy this network. Ironically, there are people on the station, the collaborators, in 1995, there was a, um, a strike going on, a union organizing at a hotel in Lafayette. And one of the organizers was being interviewed by David Bacon, the labor host on KPFA on Wednesday morning. And he was talking about, this organizer was talking about the organization that was trying to destroy their ability to organize this hotel. It was called the American Consulting Group. Now. The truth of the matter was that at that very moment, which David Bacon didn't talk about, was that Pat Scott had hired the American Consulting Group to destroy the unions of KPFA and KPFK. And so here you see these people up KPFA, you, they're still there pretending to be progressive and pretending to be radical, and they do some great stuff, but right on their own doorstep, they are collaborators. More than useful idiots, they don't know exactly what they're doing. And, we have, and the same thing with the people who found the safe KPFA. They know exactly what they're doing. They, <laughs> some people have told me they want to make the station safe for the Democrats. <laughs> um, there's a pretty good argument for that. I mean, not that I support that, but that's a good argument. That's, a, that's what they want to do. But you have the situation where you go through the whole history of this. And by the way, there's a historian named Matthew Lazar, and who is supposed to be the KPFA historian. He's quoted in the newspapers. He wrote an article two years ago, is Pacific Worth Saving, which totally whitewashed everything I've said. But he actually didn't mention any of the facts I've said, because he's not a historian. He is, he is a, uh, a lackey. Uh, a useful idiot, collaborator, whatever, but this is part of what you're struggling against in trying to keep this, this network alive. And uh, I would recommend to you something I've contributed to two years ago called Pacifica Chronology. You can find it online. And there are many, many more things here that um, you will find uh, about what happened which is important to read to understand what is going on. If you don't know your history, you don't understand the issues involved in the struggle. But I'll tell you right now, none of the, the people who, who were the new Save KPFA, the new one, the ERSATS one, were around to help the struggle to save KPFA and Pacifica at the time we were fighting to save it. So I will conclude there, and thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Now, one of the uh, little known facts about KPFA is that it used to have a women's department and put on programming on women. And we learned at the local station board that there is indeed going to be programming on Women's Day uh, at KPFA. Uh, but the struggle to have a women's department, uh, African-American department, Latino department, uh, and a labor department uh, could be an important asset to KPFA and Pacifica of all these struggles that are going on uh, in, uh, around the country. And what, the next speaker, uh, Mariah Glarden with TUC Radio, was one of the people that fought for the women's department and was banned uh, by KPFA, as has been reported by Jeff Blankford. Welcome, Mariah Glarden. It's really great to be here and see so many familiar faces. After all these years, I mean, we sort of retired in 1999 from the Bay Area and live with coyotes and bears now, which are much friendlier than some of the people involved in Pacifica. Um, uh, I was so moved by uh, the dilemma now that I'm not going to recount my personal history, as oh. somebody asked me. Um, uh, although I've, I was, I earned the name Mariah the Pariah then, and uh, <laughs> I kind of proudly remember that moment. Um, for me, pretty much all the good things began 
when I finally left, left Pacifica, left KPFA, well, I didn't have a choice. I was fired and I was banned. Actually, we had a meeting in Los Angeles where all the banned people had a reunion and there were over a hundred and I didn't quite know who to expect. The, the group of band programmers and volunteers at KPFK was the biggest. And I was totally amazed when I walked into the room that almost everybody was African American. And then people came up to me and said, I heard you were banned from all Pacifica stations and the archives and the national, yes. Oh, I only got banned from KPFK. <laughs> So, so, so much for history. So why, the reason why I just chose two topics, one the FM licenses and the second one uh, the union issue is that to me they seem bound up with the problems right now and maybe what I remember, what I see could be helpful in finding our way through. Um, the FM licenses um, are so dear to me because when I left, I became very involved in the low power FM movement. And we fought tooth and nail for every single FM license. And we have thousands of stations now out there, under 100 watt. And I had a, had a gentle revenge with Pat Scott because she was one of the people who helped kill the under 100 watt stations, and then people like Stephen Dunifer and Free Radio Berkeley were the ones who said, well, if we're banned, we're going on the air illegally, and that's how these stations began. And the very first broadcast Stephen Dunifer did was during our fights with uh, KPFA, uh, outside the door of KPFA, we tied the antenna into the decorative plum tree that some design I put there. And I, I snuck in and turned all the monitors inside to, and we broadcast, um, well, what we thought about KPFA at that time. So my care for, my respect for, my love for FM licenses uh, began with, of course, with Pacifica because they were one of the first FM licenses around. They were ready to go AM, but that wasn't possible. And they built their own radios, as you know, because nobody was using FM. So that's, that's a topic very dear to me. And when I heard that some of these licenses might be moved or sold, I said, I need to really come and urge everybody. That is the precious part of Pacifica. Buildings can be replaced. There's enough real estate that great donors gave to the station that should be leveraged against the debt, but not the licenses. And of course, people say that uh, there's the internet, and I don't know if that is shared here, but I have an extremely dim view of the internet. and. Uh, both as a technology and as a social uh, medium. So what we are finding now is um, people like Variety last August uh, wrote this article, oh, terrestrial radio is on its way out and forget about it and let's all walk arm in arm into this wonderful digital future. Uh, but Nielsen uh, ratings, who are actually um, measuring listener and viewership, uh, put out an, a report earlier this year saying that more Americans tune into AM and FM radio than to any other uh, comparable medium, TV or even smartphones, <laughs> tablets, or computers. Um, FM is a wonderful technology. It's extremely reliable. We just had fires in uh, Northern California, as you, I'm sure you know. Um, 
the only signals that survived for us in Mendocino County was the FM station because the cell phones went down within the first two hours. The towers melted, the internet was gone for most people. Uh, there was no way to communicate except on FM. And uh, in, in, you know, in bigger life during the hurricanes in Texas and Louisiana, uh, the FCC <laughs> did something good for change. They asked Apple to turn on the FM chips in the iPhones so people could use their phone to listen to the radio, which you probably know is not all that straightforward. Uh, not all of them have chips in them. Maybe somebody here knows uh, and can fill us in. So as an emergency broadcast system, FM is precious. And as a radio communications tool that is dedicated to peace, we do really need a reliable medium to preserve it, to prevent us from going into war. Um, I, I should say just a few things why I'm so um, critical of the internet. Uh, I should tell you <laughs> to begin with, that one of the best articles I read recently in The Guardian was one that suggested that Google, Facebook, and Amazon should be nationalized. Yeah. <laughs> and I won't say much more about that, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. You know, how come that some of the richest corporations in the world are feeding off something that we so humbly say, oh, please give us access to it. They have it and they make billions with their Ubers and their bread and whatever they're called. So that's, that is an issue. And as, a, as an environmentalist, a climate change activist, uh, I've been monitoring the power use of the internet as best as I can. And every now and then you get a sort of glimpse of it when they say, oh, Bitcoin. Every trans transaction for Bitcoin uses like a whole nuclear power plant to complete because it is so, it requires so many stages. But yeah, what about all the little cats playing piano on Facebook? It's the same power they require. And one of my favorite articles by Jane Ann Morris uh, is called The Bicycle Powered Internet and it was written a few years ago, so it's worse now. She tried to uh, add up um, not your power use at home, but where it goes, you know, the servers, the server farms, if what, what one Google search initiates in contacts going down the lines. And in the end, her estimate eight years ago or so was that if the internet wants to be green and would be bicycle powered, right? That would be really green. Then eight billion people would have to pedal to drive the internet six hours every day. So that was, that was a few years ago. Okay, now, now the unions. I told somebody at the door I was going <laughs> to, and she said, no, not the unions. Okay, um, but since nobody else will do it, I'll do it. Uh, I had 10 years uh, inside KPFA as a, volunteer and later as a paid staff. And I, I was so fascinated with the, uh, the principles, the ideas of Pacifica. And my, my little office was next to Vera Hopkins. Does anybody remember her? She was the historian. She was also one of the people who built FM radios. She went that far back. 
And every chance I had, I talked to her until she got booted out of the building by David Salnica. Um, so one, one of the really interesting uh, ways of organizing a radio station was that you had departments. And there was a music, drama and literature, public affairs, news, and then the third world departments. Anybody here who helped found that? The third world department happened. And then um, we did the women's department. And the, the concept, the idea was that these people who were heading the departments were not to be on the air. Their job was to find people to be on the air or record people to be on the air. They had no right to take the air. And for, you know, Pacific history is funny. That worked sometimes really well and sometimes not so well. But in terms of um, the relationship between paid staff and so-called volunteers, um, it pointed to this odd relationship that either department head said, we don't need volunteers, I'm going to own this space, I'll be on the air. Or they would say, if you're really nice, I'll give you some time, but if you're not so nice, you're out. And uh, in terms of union history, the first union at KPFA was the United Electrical Workers, the UE, which is, is one of, I don't, I actually don't know their current history, uh, but it, it came about in the, in the 30s. They had an early stand against racism. They separated themselves out from the other union movement that was anti-black because they felt that was wrong. And uh, what's really beautiful is that the United Electrical Workers in uh, 1949 left the CIO <laughs> over, the co over Cold War issues, over anti-communism. So they disassociated themselves from the CIO. And uh, when I came to KPFA, I was automatically in the UE, and I didn't even have to pay dues because I was not a paid staff, but the paid staff paid dues. And the UE was protecting me as well as others. And when Pat Scott fired me, the a UE uh, steward came in with me and he said to Pat Scott, you know, Pat Scott, I just came out of negotiations with General Electric and you are worse. Ah. So, um, WBAI was also affiliated with the UE, and in 1997, something really bad happened. Um, it, at BAI in New York, management filed an NLRB suit uh, against the UE to have unpaid staff removed from the bargaining unit. And it was a, a really interesting, in union history, like a really amazing, interesting case. You know, you do the work, so you're a worker. <laughs> Seems simple, but uh, you had to be paid to be really acknowledged. And what was even more amazing was that in the first round, the uh, NLRB found in favor of the UE, said they're right, these are workers. And then Pacifica appeared with your money. And I, I have to admit, I don't know, maybe you know, Isis, do you know what came of it in the end? The, the unpaid staff were removed from the bargaining unit. And at BAI. Yeah, I affected all unpaid staff everywhere. Yeah. Not just Thank you. So in the middle of all this same year, 1997, KPFA staff decided to leave the UE 
and joined the CWA. And I had still access to staff members who said, don't do this. <laughs> Even if you want to do it later, don't do it now. You have to support your, the UE unit at BAI. They're in the middle of this amazing, for union history, for worker history, amazing event. And don't stab them in the back, but they did. And we had a national board meeting here in Berkeley, and they all marched in with a little CWA uh, and said, hi, you know, we CWA, and bye. And we said, stay here. This is one of the more important Pacifica meetings. They're just about to, I forget now what they were just about to do, but it was. Anyway, um, I fear that uh, the union and the staff is a really is something that really needs to be looked at because in the end those people who had all the power over the volunteers who by union standards were supervisors they were management they were not part of the workers group at one time, pretty much all the workers were unpaid. And I think that's also, you know, a beautiful example for, for being able to involve people from the community. So, uh, closing out with this little, I, I'm talking to LPFM people all the time, and somebody said, you know, we, we just went out in the air and we had a big discussion. We said, um, you want to be on the air? Okay, you need to pay to be on the air. And, you know, we need to get our little transmitter built and we need to pay the electric bills. And mm, I didn't exactly support that, but I could see the point, you know. It's a privilege to be on the air. And to have people own the air for year after year after year after decade after decade is really distressing for me. I mean, the people now still owning the air, who were owning the air in 1982 when I came, and um, in terms of you know saving money, paying back the debt, uh, smaller staffs. A really a good idea, and for you, with a union heart, um, don't fear you are doing them wrong. They are managers, they are not workers, for the most part. Thank you. Now, one of the issues that, as a matter of fact, came up yesterday at the local station board meeting was that the uh, a, a unpaid staff member here, Anthony, was given a report uh, asking a question of the manager about the situation of software, editing software at the station, um, and the change of that software without notification of the staff, which is an important question. If software is changed at the station for editing, it affects everyone, it affects your ability to do work. And, and one of the board members actually had the temerity to say, how dare you ask that question? It doesn't belong here. You should privately go to the manager and ask that question. So now this is an elected staff representative raising a question, and he was challenged at that meeting that he didn't have the right to raise that question at the meeting. And that's part of the problem uh, that we have today. But I wanted to have our next speaker come up because he has been in a fight to train the apprentices and to use uh, streaming and new technology at the station. And we're going to hear later some very important developments because of the digital revolution, although there are some concerns about it, it has offered a great opportunity for KPFA and Pacifica to broaden our, our, our broadcast and broaden our coverage and also add new programs. So our next speaker uh, is uh, the... Uh, is the... Uh, uh, Frank Sterling, and he wor works with the apprentice program. He's trained many apprentices 
and he's going to talk about some of the struggles at the station and also how we can use the apprentices in the future and the work that they're doing. So welcome, Frank Sterling. Hey, hey. How y'all doing? Good to see everybody tonight. And I wasn't as prepared to come up here and give a big speech. I thought we were going to do more of a panel, but I do have a, um, a lot to say about um, KPFA and the apprenticeship program and how um, we are a network of volunteers there that have been um, volunteering for around 30 years. I believe the apprenticeship program started in the 80s, and for many years there was no on-air outlet. How many, are, uh, how many of you listen to the apprenticeship program show Full Circle? Anybody? All right, we got some fans out there. So that show didn't even get on the air until I believe it was around 2000 or the, was, I think it was after the 99 thing. It was before my time at there. Um, I came into KPFA through the apprenticeship program in 2005 as just an apprentice and learned radio through the apprenticeship program. And then uh, when I graduated in 2007, I was offered an opportunity as a fellow at KPFA on the apprenticeship program. At that time, KPFA and the apprenticeship program had three fellowships. Uh, one would be a technical director, that's uh, my current title. Another would be a segment editor, and then the third would be the executive producer. And what those fellowships were at the time was a, a one-year paid program through KPFA where you got to um, be a segment editor or be an executive producer or a technical director so that when you moved on, you would have um, you know, on your resume that you were um, a paid technical director at KPFA or you were a lead segment editor for the apprenticeship program or you were the um, senior uh, producer of a one hour weekly show. So those were great programs and when we started learning about the original crisis when people were struggling to make cuts, the apprenticeship program was one of the first to be cut and what they had taken away was the, um, the fellowships. So when my one year ended, in uh, mid-2008 or early 2009, um, I just stayed on and they let me stay on. But the other two that dropped out, um, the senior producer and the segment editor, they had initiated a hiring freeze at KPFA and they wouldn't allow us to hire any more help. So the apprenticeship program, you know, had, had suffered a little bit through the, uh, through the crisis, the financial crisis in the earliest days. And I think at that point too, there was also a lot of... Um, Severance packages, severance people had um, quit for the severance packages and they had cut like Hard Knock, um, some Flashpoint and some other um, shows that you might be familiar with were, were cut out of there. Um, I was trying to do some math earlier and seeing how the apprenticeship program uh, provides volunteer work for KPFA. And right now we have about eight uh, volunteers that come in weekly and we provide about 1,200 hours a year. Um, that's just kind of a low estimate because we actually do more work than we um, a lot for. So I think the apprentices um, put in about three to four hours uh, is what we ask of them a week. Um, and what they're doing there is they're serving the station. They're answering the phones. One thing that the apprenticeship does is we're like the face or the voice um, to the community because when you call in and you want a PSA or a, um, a public service announcement or a community calendar announcement or when you mail your events in, they come to us and then we filter through them and reach out and get contact information and produce the community calendars and the PSAs, amongst other things that we do there. So um, that's one thing I'm really proud of that the apprenticeship program, I didn't do the math over 30 years, but a few times uh, 1,200, maybe um, 1,500 times 30 years, you can see that we put in many volunteer hours at KPFA. I'm really proud to be a part of that. And another thing that I am very interested in, and I was part of the local station board from, I think it was 2009 or 10, and then I did six years um, as a staff elected representative until I think the 2015, I think is when I turned out, so I couldn't uh, run again. And one thing that I really wanted to get into, as Steve mentioned, was the uh, the video streaming aspect. And I can wave to the camera over there, if anybody hasn't noticed over there at the camera, that this is being video streamed right now, right? Um, one of my uh, most, uh, I don't know if most famous or one of my most proudest moments of a video streaming was the Block the Boat, the event. You guys remember Block the Boat? Anybody a part of that? So when the Zim ship was coming in and we were gonna have, they were gonna have a big protest at the, at the port, I tried to arrange with the organizers of the event to why don't we have a live stream um, and have KPFA video stream that and also have it broadcast live on the air. And if many of you remember, I had the green light for a little while, but then they, they said no. 
And then we started a big email campaign to the management and they um, went back to the original plan and we had a great video stream. Um, John over there was the videographer. And if many of you remember that day, um, it's actually still up on YouTube. If you can still watch it, if you search KPFA and block the boat, you can see the interviews. And um, it was something I was really proud of. We got a lot of feedback from people all over the world that watched that and were part of that. And I think it's, it marks um, not just a turning point for KPFA because we had done other video streams thanks to John. In 2009, I believe, I did the Iraq, uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War um, roundtable and we video streamed that where we had veterans come in and talk about their experiences of war. And we also spoke with um, victims of the war. So it's something I really wanted to do. And um, through my experiences with some of the management, we've had issues getting it brought to the forefront. And I think now we're seeing that um, Democracy Now, they've been videoing for a long time. And who's the um, young lady from Southern California, Sonali Kahatkar, she has a free speech TV. So there are people doing it. And I think it's something that we could do. As apprentices, we were live streaming our weekly show with just a webcam in the corner so you could just see us. Um, but we've had um, special events where we went out in the public. As Steve mentioned, that's one of the great things about KPFA. When KPFA is broadcasting its regularly scheduled program, um, there used to be a video channel on KPFA. Anybody remember the video channel? It was kind of new, it worked for a few times, but when they recreated the website, they left it out. And one thing that um, puzzled me about it and made me start thinking is, why did they leave that out? But one thing I realized at the moment, it was our, um, our free access to KPFA. It, we didn't have to fit in the 24 hour slice of pie that is the radio broadcast of the day. While the radio went on, we could be on the internet broadcasting live at another event, broadcasting music, um, broadcasting protest. We did the um, March for Climate Leadership. You guys remember the big March for Climate Leadership um, a couple years back? So we video streamed that um, through the march, and then we set up a table at the end, and we sat down and did interviews. And it was basically without any management support. And I think we're missing out on possible revenue from, um, you know, speaking of the crisis and the financial crisis, a uh, possible revenue from that. One example I want to bring up is the, um, I can't think of his first name, but he's coming up a KPFA speaker, Finkelstein. Uh, you guys know his first name? Norman Finkelstein. So this is a person that has a worldwide recognition. Um, it was, is one reason to video stream, right? Because if you have a KPFA event in Berkeley and the building holds um, 200 people, you're limited to selling 200 tickets. And I've seen in the past, they just had an event, they had to upgrade the place because the first place sold out. So imagine um, selling tickets around the country or around the world for a, video, um, a virtual ticket, you know? So we could um, sell this for the price of a ticket, you can get sent a link and you could watch the video stream at home. And it also um, can help people that might have disabilities that are homebound that want to participate and want to watch. And I think that's the, um, the beauty of the live stream is that people that want to be a part of stuff that can't actually get there and be a part of it can be a part of it through video streaming, whether it has, um, commentators and people, you know, giving you context of what's happening or just running a camera at a speaker um, and watching them, listening to them speak. So um, the Finkelstein event. So one thing that we could do is we could sell those virtual tickets to people around the um, country, around the world. They could watch that. And um, I think one of the arguments against that might be that, well, maybe people won't go to the event or maybe people won't buy the KPFA DVD later because they already saw it. But I think people that attend the events um, still want to get the sound or still want to get the video. And I think the same will be for people that watch it virtually um, through the internet. They'll still want to participate. And they still, if they did buy it, they bought a ticket. So it's a little extra profit. So um, I want to do more video streaming. I've talked to John a couple of times. We've done numerous ones. We've got a camera. Um, Carol Wolfley and some of her friends got us this great camera that we haven't really been able to utilize. and. That's one thing I really would like KPFA to do in the future is to have a video channel on there. The first time we had it on the original website, it was so simple. It, you look to the left of the screen and there's a video camera. You click on the video camera and it takes you to a video screen and then you click on that link and you watch the video. And it could pop up at any time um, if someone was out there in the street, but now they have eliminated that. And let me just give you one more quick example of what we would have to do now if you wanted to have a video stream, a random video stream. You'd have to create a community calendar event and 
So a random person um, in the, uh, out in cyberspace or the internet would want to watch. They would have to go to the community calendar web page and then they would have to click on the event and you can't put a hyperlink in the event. So they have to click on the event, get to the event, read, and then you could put a link in the event. And that link would take you to the video space and then you click on a link there. So you can see it's already going and going and going. So um, one thing that I... I spoke with the man, I'm blanking on his name too, the young man that has done our current um, web page. And how many of you know that our web page was even done with like with the no bid deal? Do you guys remember that? You guys remember that? So I was part of the LSB at that time. So, and uh, I believe it was the current management, uh, Mr. McCoy, who had worked at the museum in Oakland. He had done the website there and he had um, some guys that were gonna do it for us. So, um, Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up, that our website was done through a, a no-bid deal where we could, you know, who knows what we could have had. Some people are not happy with the website. Um, I'm not a big user of it, so. But I did talk to one of the men that had worked on it, and he says we are capable of having a video channel back on there. So it's something I want to bring up, and I know that they tried to do some video on the Black History Month on Saturday. Did anybody see any of that? No? I wasn't sure either because I didn't get a chance to do that, but... <laughs> Um, I think it's a possibility and something that we could use and it's something that could be on kpfa.org while the radio is playing whatever it's playing and it could be an alternative um, stream and it could also be um, partially monetized um, in these certain aspects by broadcasting the KPFA speeches, the KPFA talks. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Um, since we're talking about the crisis tonight, I think um, if we think back to the time of the cutbacks at KPFA when we lost um, the Fellows for the Apprenticeship Program. We lost some folks from Hard Knock Radio, from Flashpoints, and from other spaces in KPFA. Um, we had the morning mix at that time. You guys remember the morning mix? <laughs> All right. So whether you're a fan of the morning mix or not, or you know what you thought about the morning show, which I actually loved when um, Andrea, remind me of her last name? And Lewis. Andrea Lewis was um, doing the morning. I was a really big fan of that. And then I remember she moved and came back and she had a different show and stuff. But when we were struggling for income and someone tried to make a decision to um, have an hour in the morning, five days a week, that was a program of volunteers, you know, it was fought hard against by a lot of people. And it just goes to show some of the things that people have to make those decisions, try to do stuff like that. And there's so many different opinions at KPFA, which is one of the beauty of KPFA, but it also sometimes is the downfall. And I just thought that was a glorious time that we had made this move and we had um, volunteers working. We were on prime time. We had uh, a rotating cast of different ideas and different visions of people. And that's kind of one thing that I'm also proud of about the KPFA apprenticeship program is because we bring people in that are from different backgrounds of different nationalities, different genders, different everything, and they get to create a one-hour radio show. And I think that shows the power of community um, getting involved with a station like KPFA. And like I said, they've been doing that. Um, we have been doing that for over 30 years and been on the air um, for probably 18 or 20 years in the form of a full circle radio on Friday nights, um, Friday nights at 7 p.m., by the way. And real quick, while I'm thinking about it, um, the KPFA Apprenticeship Program is seeking new applicants. Um, if you know anybody or are interested yourself in being on the radio, you could go to KPFA and get an application during normal business hours, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. But you could also download one on the KPFA Apprentice webpage, which is kpfaapprentice.org. And um, before they did our new website, this is why we're speaking of the websites, and uh, what I'm talking about, the KPFA Apprenticeship Program created the WordPress website and where we got to post a lot of our stuff before KPFA really um, did their new site. And we're looking into um, posting on kpfa.org. We, um, we got one apprentice here. Who got, how many apprentices we got here? We got Sharon Peterson. Raise your hand, Sharon, so you know. So Sharon is a current apprentice. You know, there's not too many of us here tonight, but we are uh, mighty. And what we do is we post on um, the KPFA website, the community calendars and all that other stuff too. But we really want to um, start posting more on the KPFA website. But we do have a beautiful website called kpfaapprentice.org. And we've been posting photos there, um, links to important articles, um, extended interviews to some of the interviews we, that we do. 
um, that are cut short for airtime. So um, before I continue rambling, uh, I would just like to say that one thing I want to look forward to and I encourage us all to support is the video streaming on KPFA because that's going to open up a whole nother um, avenue, one for content and for um, the video aspect. But also, uh, it could be a financial gain for us if we learn how to monetize that and if we sell virtual tickets to certain events. I mean, a lot of times I don't even want to drive out just from Antioch to see something, but I would sit at my computer and watch it and I'd be willing to um, buy a virtual ticket. And I know a lot of other people out there would. And uh, one thing, another thing that is an issue with this is I think we need to really get behind um, supporting this on the air. If we're going to do a big video broadcast, it needs to be um, promoted, talked about, and focused on to make it a success. And I think if we could get management support, maybe we could do it for Normal Fink Norman Finkelstein, because that's someone I feel like that can get uh, some draw from people around the country or around the world. And so um, if you're just out there, you're on the internet, you're sending emails out, why don't you send, um, send some out to the uh, general manager of KPFA, I think it's gm at kpfa.org, program director PD at KPFA, and say that you support video streaming on KPFA and that you'd like to watch um, KPFA when you can, or you'd like to uh, see an event that you might not be able to make it to from home. And I guess I'll just leave it at that. And if there's going to be questions later, I'm not sure if there is, I'll be willing to answer any questions about um, KPFA that I know or the apprenticeship program. Personally, like I said, I'm coming up on 15 years. It's, uh, it's been an honor to kind of sit here and hear the histories that have been coming out, you know, people that back, you know, from before I was there. So it just uh, makes me feel good to stand up here and to be able to actually speak after these folks. And that, you know, I've been there almost 15 years now and the people that are speaking tonight, you know, there's over a hundred years of um, voices here that are coming of experience, you know, and <laughs> I think it's good to listen to because um, our stories are KPFA, just like your stories are KPFA, however you're tied to it, whether you're a phone room volunteer, um, whether you're a paid staff member, or whether you just um, are a listener that donates. You know, KPFA is all of our station, and I think um, that's one thing that we have to remember when we're in these times of crisis, that we need to um, be acknowledged as listeners who are paying for the lights, who are paying for people's um, health care and their salary. Um, we, as people that give to KPFA, need to be kept in the light about um, what's happening with KPFA, the financial matters. Um, I'm one believer that if we'd uh, put this out, you know, that we were struggling with this in the beginning and that we needed to do something, our listeners and our base and our, our people out there would support us. And they wouldn't be such a shock that, oh, we're good, we could close our doors in two weeks or something. This should have been something that was brought up early and that was look to the listeners for answers. Look to um, what the people who have been supporting us all these years, you know, even generations of their families who they've been supporting all these years, let them know what our situation is so they could actually make a difference. Yeah. And I'll leave it on that. And uh, we learned some very exciting developments yesterday at the local station board meeting. It was brought up, uh, and Tom Voorhees uh, is going to talk about it later, and that is that through digital technology, um, we can get a digital transmitter at KPFA that would change from an analog transmitter, which we presently have, to digital, which would allow two new channels uh, on, on KPFA. And the reason that's important is not only it allows additional voices, uh, but there's a lot of programming that needs to be brought into KPFA, which has been excluded, which has been prevented from being there. We have to get young voices on, and we have to be able to do that to open spaces. And actually, uh, it would cost $60,000, but it would be a whole new channel. And I think one of the issues that that raises is the fight for more Spanish programming. California has a large percentage of Latino Spanish speaking population. KPFA and Pacifica need to have voices directly to the population, the Spanish speaking population. And that is critical if we're going to have a hearing among the mass of people in this country. In Los Angeles, uh, for example, there are a million Iranian Americans. No Iranian programming on KPFK. Uh, there are uh, 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 large minority communities, a million Koreans 
Korean Americans in Los Angeles, no Korean programming. We have to reach out and broaden our programming. And I think that uh, the national board has passed a motion called for Spanish programming, and people are fighting for that. And one of the issues is uh, keeping the Spanish programming and developing it. And so there's opportunities to expand it. Uh, Pedro Reyes, who is our next speaker, uh, has been a long-term programmer at KPFA and fought for Spanish-speaking programming and also had a struggle to get notification from the management about changes that were brought in unilaterally without the staff being notified. So welcome, Pedro Reyes. Everyone, good evening. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, talking about Spanish radio, expanding our, you know, language to that ability to who's the majority here really does help. Uh, you know, we've been, I've been a part of uh, KPFA for 20 years now. Uh, I started in 1999, I think, it's uh, 2018, so almost 20 years, yeah. So basically, uh, you know, starting out in La Onda Bajita, which does a Chicano program, uh, and focuses on native issues, immigrant rights issues, and uh, people of color issues, basically, right? And low income. Uh, and basically seeing the fact that there was no Spanish programming, 1999 come around, right? We, we, I started to think with Gavilan, hey, Gavilan, you know what? There's no Spanish programming, what's up? You know, how come KPFA don't have no Spanish programming? And we decided, hey, you know what? Why don't we do the first uh, Friday of the month, we'll do all Spanish programming. So what we did was we turned that first Friday into Spanish programming. Ended up, uh, now we've been doing Spanish programming for that first Friday for over, for 20 years now, you know? So basically, uh, now we hold down that information about Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Centro America, Sur America, right? And we talk about all those politics that are going on down there that are not really well known through other sources of you know, information that are actually on KPFA in that sense of living that experience of being in the war, living in that sense of being poor, right? Living in that experience of having to uh, migrate and be forced to migrate by US foreign policies, right? And unfortunately, uh, what happens is that we start to notice that fact that, you know, even the majority starts to develop here in California, and we still don't have Spanish programming on Pacifica, I'm sorry, KPFA, right? The majority of programming we have on, on Pacifica, on KPFA, is basically English programming. You know, I started to investigate, because I, I do some investigating sometimes, and you know, <laughs> next thing you know, I play it on the radio, right? Uh, so basically, I started to investigate and was checking out these fund drives and seeing, okay, well, you know, we get about $1,000 in on a Friday night, right? And we talk Spanish. And so I go to other people, how much do you guys? Oh, 700, 600, 500, sometimes 200. And they talk English, right? And I go, see, I think that tells us something that the dollar doesn't only speak English, right? The dollar is, multicultural, speaks many languages. But here in KPFA, we only speak English 99, 95% of the time, right? That's all week long, right? Till you get to Friday night, and then maybe Sunday, one hour of Spanish broken rebellion, but doesn't really focus on the issues, right? So again, the idea is that I've been a volunteer for 20 years and still fighting to bring in Spanish programming. Suddenly we get a mandate from Pacifica saying, hey, there's a raza in Califas and we need them to be able to understand some of the information that's not being spoken about in Spanish. So to this day, we're still waiting. Where's the Spanish news programming that we were promised that was mandated whatever that means, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that funding never came. That funding, there was talks about having Spanish news programming and that there would be funding. Suddenly all the funding was not there no more, right? Oh wait, but this other English program 
gets another hour, and this other program gets moved to the 5 a.m. hour. That also gets paid at KPFK. I mean, who are you trying to fool, right? So the idea is, again, now they went and cut volunteer programming again. Just like Frank was mentioning, the morning mix was cut five days in a row, right? One hour of volunteer programming every day cuts the cost down, right? They come to my show. Three times they tried to move me. They say, hey, you got to go somewhere else. You got to do another time slot. I'm like, what? What? When did this happen? How did you guys decide this? I, I was never told. Oh, yeah, you're taking over a bacha's pl place on Tuesday nights from 8 to 10. What's the big deal? And then Avacha is going to be doing your show Wednesday, Wednesday early mornings from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Like you realize she's 80 years old and that she's on a roller, that she drives a handicap van, that she's barely able to walk into the building sometimes, right? What happens? Oh, no, that's not, you don't have no say in that. Who cares what you have to say? I'm like, really? You're going you're gonna to make me move an elder into a night shift, graveyard shift, and have me in an 8 to 10 slot, comfortably you know, coming in on a nice time Tuesday night? I'm like, that doesn't make no sense, right? Of course, they didn't ask us for any input. Of course, they didn't give us any warning. And of course, they just went ahead and tried to force us to do it. They said, next week, you guys are doing it. If you don't do it, you guys are out, or whatever the consequence might have been. So, you know, I started talking to some volunteers and being like, hey, what's going on? How come they want Avacha to do 1 o'clock in the morning? And all the homies and homegirls said, no, you know what? That's not cool. They're not going to move Avacha. She's been doing that. She's the teacher. She's the maestra. You don't go and move the maestra. I'm like, hey, I'm not trying to, and I'm not going to either. You know, they can say whatever, but I'm not going to do it. Right? So we went and we fought that. UPSO got together and finally figured out, hey, this guy's right. You know, there's too much, there's too much movement going on. We, we just can't stop them from not doing what we, what we, we can't stop them from doing what we want, right? And basically, he came down. That was the first time. Second time, hey, you're moving again. Oh, whoa. Why, why am I moving again? You know, like, it's, it's the early slots, right? All of a sudden, traffic has gotten more congested. So now, traffic starts at 4 a.m., so you don't have, you, you're out. I'm like, whoa, really? I, I, I knew that. I mean, I get out at 5, 6 in the morning, I'm already stuck in traffic going back to the city. Right? After doing a late night show, five hours, right? One in the morning till six in the morning. I've been doing that show since about 10 years now, right? All of a sudden, right? Boom. We, we we're going to cut you an hour, and basically, you don't have no say again, right? It's like, okay, well, this is now the third time this is happening to me where they don't tell me, they don't actually give me any type of notification, and they expect me to do something from one week to the next. Now, I'm going like, but how does this make sense? We're in a financial crisis last month. This month we're doing great, yay, right? And all of a sudden, people start to separate themselves from Pacifica. Oh, well, Pacifica's doing bad not KPFA, right? Come on. If Pacifica's doing bad, we know KPFA is doing bad. And all the other radio stations are doing bad, right? So when they make this decision about, hey, we're going to expand this show an hour, we're going to give this other show in another, uh, we're going to move this show and take away your hour, and then all the other music shows that go during the week too, not just me, right? It was also Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, except for Friday, 
right? And so the idea is that, again, what happened there? They took five hours of volunteer time. Now they're paying three different shows, spending three times the money versus three times less, right? Management, Quincy, right? And so I go to the Nellis board meeting, try to get some information, try to see what's going on. I wait three hours to speak three minutes. Hey, I waste my time. I figure it out. You know, somehow I just text the people, hang out there, you know, made that time. Because my voice is important somehow, somewhere, maybe to somebody, right? So I figured maybe somebody will listen to me. Nope, nothing happened after that. I'm still, my hours been cut. All of our music programs during the week, Monday through Thursday, have been cut. Right, all the way up till five in the morning, then you get Sonali, which is again a you know a syndicated show that's paid in KPFK. Right? They tell me, oh no, we don't pay, we don't pay Sonali. I'm like, come on, you're Pacifica. You're not you, you gotta somebody's gotta pay her. She's not doing that for free, right? <laughs> I'm doing it for free. You know, I'm doing ten hours of volunteer for free for Pacifica, for KPFA. I don't separate myself from Pacifica. That's 10 hours I give to Pacifica every week. One in the morning to five in the morning for 10, 15 years. <clears throat> now, they also said, you don't do public affairs. I'm sorry, what? I save my public affairs for five in the morning till six in the morning because I know there's traffic. I'm sorry you just found out. <laughs> I have to deal with traffic every time I go back to San Francisco, being awake all night, early in the morning to be there for my kids to take them to school, right? But that don't matter to management. They didn't come up to me and said, hey, you know what? Uh, we we want to hear more public affairs. How can we work with you? How can we be able to get you to do some more interviews in Spanish and English? You know, there's a lot of raza out there getting up at five in the morning, going to go do janitor work or just stocking or whatever, you know, right? It's like, no, they just said, you're out. We, we got a pre-recorded program. We can play any time and we chose your time. I'm like, wow, really? Okay, well, you know, that's kind of what I see now, part of the problem that when we separate KPFA from Pacifica, we begin to lose that understanding that we're under this bigger umbrella. Mm -hmm. Whether we volunteer there or we are paid, if Pacifica's not doing well, then KPFA and other radio stations are also gonna go down. So when I say, you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll cover somebody's show because they're sick, because they can't make it, because they've been there so long that you know their body starts to hurt. They don't catch any sleep. They don't get to rest. When they need a vacation, hey, I'll cover your show. Yeah, take some rest, you know, so that people can be able to, but they don't pay me, right? I do it on a voluntary basis, right? And so what I've been doing with KPFA is also been going on the field. I've been streaming on the field. I've been a mobile broadcaster on the field. Not once have I gotten paid for that. It's all volunteer. But management has never come to me and said, hey, you know what? I think you got something here. Maybe you could start a, you know, training some of the folks here to go out into the field. And that's when we brought in Frank. Frank knows that I go out into the field. I go to Alcatraz at five in the morning set up a radio station that's going to transmit to KPFA. I've gone to marches where we broadcast from the back of the stage, live on the street, direct. We hook up ISDN lines, we do wireless, we do whatever it takes to get that signal off the ground from the street at that moment when it's needed. And not once has management come, has management come up to me and give me a shake. Not once. I've gone through three managers. Maybe four, this, you never know, right? 
And none of them, not even one, has come up to me and said, oh man, we really appreciate that anti-war protest you, you guys had on last week. No, they go to the host, right? They don't come to me. Oh, Dennis, you did a great job. Oh, you know, Gavilan, or, you know, da 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 da. But they don't know I'm the one that's also in the field, right? They don't bother to even ask me. Now, as part of being in the field, we also did mobile broadcasting. Some people might remember New College, right? In San Francisco, we did broadcasting from out there. We set up a whole setup where we had almost like an uh, satellite studio, put it that way. We started out with just a room like this, little chairs, a dirty carpet, and a table. It was called the Creamery. I don't know, you might remember, it's on 19th and Valencia, right? And what we did there, right? We started working with college students, teaching them about journalism, how to get involved with KPFA, how to give them access to KPFA as journalists. Right? And we also developed programming that was focused around Raza and the Barrio, that was focusing on talking about issues in the mission, that was talking about gentrification, that was talking about gang warfare, that was talking about police brutality, that was talking about all the different issues that San Francisco focuses on and bringing in those organizers right there in the mission, from the mission. Right? And so what we did was we also brought in bands. We brought musicians. We, we made it to the point where we had musicians being broadcasted on the radio, on the internet, and at the same time we had multiple buildings where we could have a band here, and then in the other building we could also be on another channel on the mixer where we had the host. I was able to do all this just because I was experimenting with sound. I love sound. And I love finding ways to liberate sound. I'm a part of the micro radio movement. So I come from Santa Cruz, Free Pirate Radio, Free Radio Santa Cruz, right? I did pirate radio for six years. That radio station got busted three times by the FCC and it still continues to make a point of fighting to be able to be on the airwaves to this day, right? So when I hear, you know, like people complaining that, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're losing funding, but then no one's really stepping up to volunteer. When our station is going down, a lot of people will say, you know what? I'm just going for whatever happens, but I'm going like, no, man, I come from micro radio. We got the backup already set up across the street. <laughs> we ain't waiting for them to come and take over the building. We're going to start broadcasting as soon as they start to, you know, put up those guards in front of those doors. No, hell no. We ain't going to let the empire strike us down, right? So the idea, again, is to liberate the airwaves, to give access to the airwaves. And as a volunteer, that's what I do. That's what I love to do. So again, the reason I do it is because I want my people to have a voice. I want my community to also have access to the airways. And I'm one of the few at the station that has been there for so long that can be able to do this. But after 20 years of not seeing someone else of my color come in and be able to have these types of, you know, opportunities to open the doors to their communities, right? It makes me sad. It makes me sad that we don't allow that growth, that we don't see that opportunity of these voices who really need the microphone to have access to them and their support for us to be able to continue on the airways. So again, the more Spanish programming we have, right, the more diverse voices we have, like I also like to speak other languages and have people who, other, who speak other languages on the radio. And you know what, if you don't understand it, oh well, figure it out, you know, because that's their native tongue. 
And, you know, and I appreciate hearing that many times. So I think I'm going to leave it there. But again, the idea is as a volunteer, I did file a harassment complaint to management. Never got, never heard back from them. I also filed a harassment complaint to Pacifica. Never heard back from them. They said, hey, it's OK. It's just you. It's just, it's just an hour. Don't worry about it. Get some sleep, you know? Really? Uh, OK, well, I'll figure it out, right? And so basically, to this day, I have not heard from anybody back about these you know, harassment complaints that I've made. And unfortunately, that's how volunteers are treated at KPFA. We don't matter. Not, e not even the LSB, and I'm sorry to say, but you know, I went to the LSB, right? I went through the whole process. What is the process for filing a complaint by a volunteer? I go to Richard Withers, who also took me off the air in KFCF. He says, hey man, you fell asleep one time. I'm like, bro, that's like the first time in 20 years. <laughs> no, 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 yo, you keep waking me up and blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, I had to figure it out. I'm like, you know, I apologized to him. I said, hey, I'm sorry if, if this was actually, you know, a problem that happened. But, you know, I really do apologize. I didn't know. I wasn't aware. And all of a sudden, you know, he's like, well, what other shows do you do? I'm like, what? I cover a lot of shows. Well, I'm going to make sure you're not on KFCF no more. And I'm like, wow, really? Like, just because that one time. I mean, this is white power in that sense of, like, abusing it, so to speak, right? But this is, I, I go and look at KFCS website, Save KPFA, Brian Edward Teekers is all over that place, right? And other people there too on Save KPFA. No people of color. You're talking about Fresno here, right? Mm -hmm. Central Valley, who lives there? Really? <clears throat> Save KPFA? I don't know. But since he took me off the air, now he's going to have to figure out how to fill in 10 hours on his own. And he also threatened to take off La Onda Bajita, which is not in the middle of the night, right? Oh, I'll take off that Chicano program, right? It's like, OK, well, you know, I guess you have a problem with Plaza, right? Because all I was trying to say was sorry and hoping that you would put my show back on the air. And unfortunately, he couldn't even handle that. So uh, I'm still stuck on that battle, too. I'm just trying to do radio. That's all, right? So again, uh, I appreciate everybody here. And thank you for you know, supporting KPFA in many different ways. And remember that we are not just uh, phone volunteers. We are volunteers that come in every night, every week, right? And do our volunteering on the radio, on the airwaves. Versus like phone, phone volunteers just come in once every three months, maybe an hour or two, right? Lucky. And so, <laughs> and so again, we volunteer every week. Not just, you know, one hour, but at least five, right? So thank you. You know, the, the volunteers are an important part, a critical part of KPFA. They make it run and Pacifica, as a matter of fact. And one of the things we've been fighting for uh, is a, uh, a, a meeting, a town hall meeting, uh, every uh, twice a year, which is in the bylaws. And uh, we've, I made a motion at the last meeting that we have town hall meetings. I, I know that people have to be heard. The supporters of KPFA and Pacifica have to be heard. And you can only do that in a fair way by having democratic meetings where people can come and speak and say what they think about the issues, what programming they want, and what they want to see at KPFA and Pacifica. So I hope the board at the upcoming meeting will actually agree to implement their own bylaws, which says that they have to have a town hall meeting twice a year at minimum. And I think that's something we should require. Uh, decisions are being made without consultation of the members of KPFA, of the people who give money to KPFA. That is wrong, and that has to be changed. Now, we've, uh, and I, I know it's getting on, but we do have our last speaker, 
who uh, is going to talk a bit about the whole issue of uh, governance and bankruptcy. Because frankly, when, when we were told that the station may close its doors and there had been no discussion, no reports to the listeners, that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable because frankly, we have to defend KPFA. We have to defend Pacifica. We're not going to allow the doors to be closed at KPFA. And that requires an organization, a movement to defend the station. So our next speaker is Janet Cobran, who is a just passed, uh, was on the KPFA local station board and has just been elected National Secretary of Pacifica. Welcome, Janet Cobran. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, being foundation secretary is a mixed, mixed blessing. I've received congratulations and condolences. <laughs> After serving, well, I, I, I had served on the KPFA local station board, as Steve had mentioned, and I termed out on February 4th, just recently. Let me start by saying that although some of you have been involved, very involved in KPFA and Pacifica Matters, others of you are not as familiar with all the ins and outs and the players and uh, the technical terminology. So I'll do my best to ensure that everybody can relate to what I will be addressing. Aside from identifying as an eclectic activist and having been an information technology systems analyst, much of my work in KPFA land has been unpopular. But that's because I ask questions, do research, and go against the grain. I was affiliated for many years with one of the two major KPFA factions, UCR, United for Community Radio, because I agreed with and supported its positions on unpaid staff, program council, and outreach to unrepresented communities. I think very highly of live streaming. I like to watch it because when it's done well, it makes you, it almost makes you feel like you're there um, in person. And uh, I'm so pleased that this is being live streamed. I actually did some live streaming myself. I learned uh, a little bit about it from uh, when I went to a labor tech uh, conference. Steve Zeltzer puts these on. Um, I live streamed at Occupy. Um, so, uh, and I, I have always advocated that KPFA have a live stream channel on its website. Uh, there was a, a live stream team, I guess it's not uh, operating anymore, of John Perulis and Steve and Frank and Carol Wolfley. Um, and by the way, when it comes to Spanish language programming, last year the uh, PNB rescinded the motion that mandated Spanish language programming. So that's part of why maybe some of this is happening what Pedro was talking about. I was never affiliated with Safe KPFA, whose mantra is local control and professional programming. Uh, I was a KPFA director from 2014 to 2016 and PNB secretary in 2015 and 2016, and so now I'm back. Um, on the national level, the factions are a whole different matter. Up until the middle of last year or so, there had always been two major factions. And when I was new to the PNB neighborhood in 2014, I was led to believe that they were like the two at KPFA. I soon learned that that was not the case, that there were nuances that I had been unaware of, and things were not as black and white as I originally thought. By the way, there seem to be now three factions, two of which join together against the third on different issues. In early 2014, I was part of the PDGG, Pacifica Directors for Good Governance, 
which sued Pacifica over Summer Reese's contract controversy. However, once the ju judge ruled against PDGG and Summer had to vacate the national office that she had been occupying 24-7, I realized that continuing to pursue the case, uh, which the remaining PDG directors were doing, would basically be defying a court order. I had had other issues with PDGG, like although they call themselves Indies, my experience was when anyone truly wanted to act independently, they were silenced. But the court ruling was the final straw, so I withdrew drew from the case and operated all alone for a while on the PNB until some other non-KPFA directors began reaching out to me sent me a number of documents that did not support the narrative I had come into the PNB with. And I began to develop some working relationships with people I had, had a closed mind to, and they in turn began to listen to my story about KPFA. That was very different from the safe KPFA story. When I began to exercise my director's inspections, inspection rights regarding KPFA management practices, when I inspected the personnel files and timesheets, and then when I uncovered the fact that a $400,000 bequest check that had been made out to the Pacifica Foundation had been deposited in KPFA's bank account and not the Pacifica bank account, and brought this to the attention of the PNB, I was attacked by safe KPFA advocates. This and the KPFA Foundation, which I was instrumental in exposing, caused a rift between the safe KPFA directors and the rest of the faction they were affiliated with. On the other hand, when UCR opposed positions I was taking with regards to the WBAI LSB seating controversy, and the affiliates election, both issues outside of KPFA. I was pressured by them to breach my duty of loyalty to Pacifica, which included abiding by PNB decisions, some of which I did not agree with, and instead give factional positions priority. And so I decided to disaffiliate from UCR in February 2016 and become a, uh, officially independent at that point. You can ask, well, if there's Q&A, you can ask me more about that. But I will say that I was operating as a director based on what the Deputy G uh, Attorney General Julianne Mossler told the PNB on December 14, 2017, to wit, quote, as directors on the national board, each of you owes a duty of loyalty to Pacifica to help it achieve these stated purposes. It means that your personal interests and or the interests of your local radio station must take a back seat to Pacifica's interests when you are acting in your capacity on the national board. When your personal interests or those of your local station diverge from Pacifica's interests, Pacifica's interests must always take precedence. As a director on Pacifica's national board, each of you must act in a manner you sincerely believe to be in Pacifica's interests. That means every decision you make must be made for the purpose of advancing Pacifica's interests, even if that means that the interests of your local station or even your personal in interests are adversely affected to do otherwise constitutes an impermissible conf conflict of interest that can result in your removal from the board, litigation, or even Pacifica's collapse and closure, end quote. So I mean, the Pacifica directors are, you know, there's different kinds of things that they, ha they have to be responsible to. That brings me to the crisis group which was formed in early 2015 as a so-called cross-factional group 
It is a self-selecting lobbying group, in my opinion, that operates in secret, accountable to no one, whose founding members are Eileen Alfenberry, Louis Sawyer, Brian Edwards Teekert, Carol Travis, and Margie Wilkinson on the safe KPFA side, and Virginia Browning, Susan Da Silva, Peter Frank, Adrian Lobby, Nicole Milner, Sally Summer, and Carol Spooner on the UCR side. The supposed aim is to reduce the tensions between all the national factions by opening up a dialogue between them to find some common ground. They even had a Pacifica Unity Pledge. They had people sign onto that said, quote, I am committed to participating in a network-wide consensus building process with the goal of reforming Pacifica's governance to make it simpler, effective, smaller, and calmer. They were unsuccessful in recruiting anyone outside of KPFA, but with five of their members already on the LSB, they did manage to inf infiltrate, in my opinion, the LSB. Carol Travis was already LSB chair. Uh, they recruited new LSB members in 2016, like Sharon Adams, TM Scruggs, Sabrina Jacobs, Bill Campisi, and Tim Lynch, and influenced others to be sympathetic to the point where there is now what I consider to be a crisis group supermajority on the LSB. Their mantra is, be collegial and congenial. But what that looks like in practice is that anyone who is not sympathetic to their agenda and stands up with an independent position, like I do, gets attacked. Congenial and collegial. Anyway, that's how, uh, uh, sorry. What I have seen has been the UCR side cave in to safe, safe KPFA, safe KPFA, the, the new safe KPFA, to the point that the two factions are almost indistinguishable now. And I don't see any sign anymore on the LSB or in the station of UCR fighting for what it supposedly stands for. If there were to be a delegate election this year, I have no idea how members would distinguish themselves at one slate uh, or another. It is out of this crisis group that several secret LSB retreats were organized and held in 2016 and 2017. Six proposals were drafted through the, the crisis group, presented and approved almost unanimously at the November 19, 2016 LSB meeting, one of which was called Involuntary Re Reorganization of Pacifica by Filing a Superior Court Action to Dissolve Pacifica, drafted by Bill Campisi as a tactic to basically get the PNB to cry uncle and enable K KPFA to capture the KPFA license with a KPFA LSB 501c3 to be formed by another proposal approved at that same time, that same meeting. The latter is the KPFA Foundation by a different name. Local control, yeah, local control. And then there's the bankruptcy issue that started rearing its head in the middle of 2017 with the Empire State Realty Trust summary judgment. That has been another vehicle to try to obtain local control when other options for paying what Pacifica owes ESRT were and still are possible. It's not been, it's, it's close to being resolved. Or, or, completed. All the, bank, all the bankruptcy fear-mongering with the former IED using his bully puppet to spur it along gets in the way of working out other payment options. And hopefully this will not sabotage that effort completely. 
It also appears as though the bankruptcy strategy is backfiring. Actually, it was the CFO who first introduced the idea of bankruptcy during his first tenure, which began in January 2016. And although some have credited him with getting the 2014 audit complete, he resigned in mid-September 2016, and that audit was completed in December 2016. Most of the audit schedules for the 2015 audit were done by national accounting staff before he was rehired in March 2017. What's his name? Sam Agarwal. And as far as I understand, the 2016 audit has not been completed yet. I think, I don't even, I think it's, I thought it was almost completed, but, but I read something that it's not, it's just getting started or something. Anyway, I assume that is because the CFO chose to make working on bankruptcy documents a priority over getting the audits complete. Also note that the crisis group co-founders and purported champions of fair elections, Susan De Silva and Carol Spooner, were both just appointed to the LSB, one in January and one just yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And with the former now being the LSB chair and the latter LSB treasurer. Okay, which, which brings me to the 2016 recount. At the time, I was serving as PNB secretary, and per the bylaws, I was mailed the ballots at the national office. Two CD disks were included, and while looking for the files with the electronic ballots, I discovered that most write-in candidates had not been included in the counts. And as a result, the runners-up lists on the election website were incomplete. In addition, the true ballot vendor never supplied any runners-up lists. The NES had extrapolated, did I say national election supervisor, had extrapolated them from true ballots results and posted them to her elections website. For the KPFT staff election, she omitted one of the certified candidates as a runner-up, an oversight and listed three staff members as runners-up to the WPFW listener election, as she had not vetted these write-ins on, on their membership class eligibility. She only listed six runners-up for, for the KPFA listener election when there were numerous write-ins that I had, I'm sorry, that had not been included. I brought this to the attention of the PNB, and on December 20, uh, 13, 2016, the PNB voted for the interim executive director, Lydia Brazan at the time, to direct the NES to arrange for a recount of all the ballots to correct the runners-up lists by including all the unique write-in candidates disaggregated instead of lumping them all together, as True Ballot had done. At the December 17, 2016 LSB meeting, KPFA, the crisis group supermajority arrogantly repudiated the PNB and censured me for this motion. The PNB deemed that motion null and void and uh, shortly afterwards. Terry Goodman, a longtime Pacifican, former PNB director and with expertise in Choice Plus Pro, offered to take on the project as teller gratis and issued a recount report on July 22nd, 2017 that was shared with all the LSBs. He listed the NES's certified results side by side with the recount results. In addition to the six runners up for the KPFA listeners election the NES had listed, the recount showed 20 more and five additional staff runners-up to the three the NES had listed for KPFA. At the November 2017 KPFA LSB meeting, the crisis group supermajority voted to reject using the recount results to replace vacant delegate seats. 
This set the groundwork for them to return to a self-selecting board by prematurely filling vacancies by appointment, which the bylaws allow when a runners-up list is exhausted. All this leads up to the overt machinations, maneuvers, and scheming that happened on January 6th, this past January 6th, and to this day, starting with the crisis group supermajority, including Susan Da Silva, in the single transferable voting, or STV, listener director's election nominations list due by December 31st, when she was not a current delegate, as the bylaws require, of nominees. Note that the intent of the drafters of the Pacifica bylaws for using STV elections for listener directors, I'm sorry, uh, instead of three, you know, using STV, instead of three instant runoff voting elections, IRV, that's majority wins, was to force a form of proportional representation on the PNB from among the eligible delegates at the station, at each station. Using STV in the delegates' elections serves the same purpose. But back to the scheming. What followed was that they bypassed the PNB authorized recount results to seat Susan Da Silva as a delegate replacement on January 6th. Then, during the closed session, after I objected to her being a candidate because she didn't qualify, they plotted secretly from the public a maneuver to get Susan on the PNB by hook or by crook, in which a placeholder candidate would run and win and then resign to be followed by an IRV majority election in which Susan, of course, would win. They claim no one objected, but the scheming discussion had not been part of any motion. It was all an informal discussion. They implemented their, I was there, they implemented their scheme by first holding the S STV election in which three of the four candidates were pro-bankruptcy. Within six seconds of the announcement of the results, Bill Campisi resigned from the PNB, which he hadn't been seated on yet. A second later, literally, they held the IRV director replacement election that Susan was still unqualified to run in, an election that she ostensibly won but an election that was invalid because it only applies to seated directors. Then, after the PNB voted, I'm sorry, then, then after that, the PNB voided both the process of the KPFEA LSB, uh, I'm sorry, they voided the process the KPFA LSB used to seat Susan De Silva as a delegate, the replacement process and the process KPFA delegates used to elect her as one of the three listener directors. Given that one of the three directors elect had withdrawn, the PNB deemed Tom Voorhees as the third listener director from KPFA director elect because he had come in fourth place in the STV election. Not liking the PNB decision, Bill Cambisi filed a TRO, temporary restraining order, against Pacifica, in which he included his story of what had happened and made up a bunch of things to get the court to repudiate the decision of the PNB, basically asking the judge to deem Susan De Silva as the proper holder of the director seat, amend the bylaws, and ratify the scheming. Then, I mean, that's my, how I interpret. Um, <laughs> then after Mr. Campisi admitted that Susan was indeed not qualified to run in the first place, another IRV director replacement election was held in which Aki Tanaka was the winner. 
Mr. Campisi then amended his TRO, asking the court to order Mr. Tanaka to be the proper holder of that controversial director seat. The Pacifica defense lawyer filed opposition, opposition papers on Friday that included a declaration by me, which contains a detailed chronology with documentation. The next hearing in the court case is on March 6th. The case number is RG18890224. The LSB with its crisis group supermajority has gotten away with so much. Things have gotten out of hand, and the only check on them is the PNB. I hope the court puts them in their place because they continue to meddle in crucial matters that take away resources that are needed to save Pacifica.